Hello and welcome to another edition of Foreign Dispatches, the program that takes you around the world. I'm Tenyo Alash Shoboale on the program this week. First grain ship leaves Ukrainian port on the landmark deal with Russia. Plus, U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi visits Taiwan, drawing condemnation from China. The first ship carrying grain left the Ukrainian port of Odessa this week on that a landmark deal with Russia. Russia has been blockading Ukrainian ports since February, but the two sides made a deal to resume shipments. It's hoped the agreement will ease the global food crisis and lower the price of grain. The Sierra Leone flagged ship Razoni left the Ukrainian Black Sea port of Odessa in the morning on Monday bound for Lebanon under the deal struck between Ukraine, Russia, the United Nations and Turkey to avert a global food crisis. Plus. It comes after being blockaded there since the Russian invasion began five months ago. I am very happy and my crew also too much happy to leave the Odessa port. Will be go to destination board. Maybe after that will be completed contract, and all the crew will be go to uh, home. For that, all all we are very happy. Ukraine's government called it a day of relief, and the Kremlin called the Razoni's departure very positive news. Russia and Ukraine make up nearly a third of the world's grain exports, and the conflict has worsened the world's cost of living crisis particularly for countries threatened by food shortages and hunger. What we have witnessed today in Odessa is an important starting point. It must be the first of many commercial ships bringing relief and stability to global food markets. The Black Sea Grain Initiative allows for significant volumes of exports from three Ukrainian ports, Odessa, Chornomorsk and Yuzhny. Together with the agreed facilitation of the unimpeded access of Russian food products and fertilizers to world markets, it will bring relief and stability to global food markets and help tackle the global food crisis. Ensuring that grain, fertilizers and other food-related items are available at reasonable prices to developing countries is a humanitarian imperative. People on the verge of famine need these agreements to work in order to survive. Countries on the verge of bankruptcy need these agreements to work in order to keep their economies alive. The United Nations is warning of multiple famines this year. Russia denies responsibility for the food crisis and blames Western sanctions for slowing exports and it blames Ukraine for the mines. The Ukraine president's office has previously said that 17 ships are docked waiting departure on the Black Sea with almost 600,000 tons of cargo, mostly grain. Now let's meet some of the frontline fighters barring Russia's advance in Ukraine. Near Izium in the Kharkiv region, Ukraine's Carpathian 6th Battalion has been joined by foreign fighters. They face daily bombardment, but say Ukraine's fight against Russian forces is worth the risk. Standing in the way of the Russian advance in eastern Ukraine, a Ukrainian battalion and a unit of foreign nationals who answered Kyiv's call for help. They are about half a mile from Russian positions, defending the captured eastern city of Izium. Denis Polishchuk was born in Ukraine, but lived in Vancouver before the war. What am I going to tell my children, God willing, I have them someday, um, when, when they grow up, or even my grandchildren, and they ask me about these, you know, these truly historical times we're living in. Uh, and I felt that <clears throat> the only um, dignified response would be that, yes, I was doing my part. I was, I was fighting alongside with everyone else. Polishchuk is part of one of several paramilitary nationalist groups that began as volunteers in 2014 when Russia annexed the Black Sea Peninsula of Crimea and backed pro-Russian armed separatists in Ukraine's eastern Donbass region. Moscow brands such former paramilitary groups far-right extremists and justified its invasion by saying it wants to denazify Ukraine. They strongly reject the charge.
The fighters recently captured a Russian tank almost intact. They also contend with Russian drones that direct artillery fire to their positions. Field commander says if Russian forces broke through here, other units could be outflanked. Connor is an ex-army medic. He says images of wounded women, children and fighters without adequate medical help prompted him to leave Britain. Seeing how little training and knowledge they had to be able to help, so I thought some of the knowledge that I've been trained in, bring it out here and we've helped set up field hospitals. It's getting a lot tougher out here the longer it goes on. It is definitely tiring. Um, sleep patterns are broken from shelling, um, so they shelled at one, two, and four o'clock in the morning yesterday, so that's obviously breaking our sleep routine up, but we've got to stay positive. Two Britons and a Moroccan citizen captured fighting with the Ukrainian army were sentenced to death as mercenaries by a Russian-backed separatist court in June. Polishchuk says the threat of capture scares him, but not enough to deter him. It's not going to stop me. It's not going to change my decision. It's definitely something that you have to keep in mind and consider. Uh, but at the same time, this is war. <laughs> um, you know, we all know why the, the possible consequences of us being here, uh, and we've uh, we've all made peace with that. Since mid-May, the battalion's fighters have been able to sign military contracts that entitled them to pensions and treatment at military hospitals. A move Kiev says shows nationalist units have been reformed and successfully integrated into the regular armed forces. Mala Tokmaka is one of the Ukrainian community surviving close to the war front line. Although thousands of people have left the region since the start of the invasion in February, many residents say they have no other option but to stay. Most people have long since left the village of Malatokmachka in Ukrainian-held territory, a couple of kilometers from the front line in southern Ukrainian Zaporizhia region. But not Anna, a middle-aged 25-year army veteran who has no place to go. I'm a military person. My entire life, I carried a pistol on my belt. Fear or no fear, we must hold on. My husband also used to be in the military, but now he's paralyzed. Where would we go? Anna rattles off a list of things nobody has any more around here. There is no electricity, there's no water, there's no gas no shops to buy anything. I have no idea how people have survived here since the war. We're just trying to hold on. Five months into Russia's invasion, ordinary life has largely returned to the capital, Kyiv, and other northern cities where Russian forces were driven away. Further east, in the active battle zone of the Donbass, there is a hot war raging, with Ukrainians fleeing towns and cities in the path of Russia's ferocious advance. But along a much longer stretch of hundreds of kilometers of front line that winds through the south and east, lie countless ghost villages like Mala Tomachka. Armies are not trying to push through here, though shells still land occasionally fired from Russian positions captured early in the conflict. Farmers cannot harvest their crops. I'm an agriculture worker myself, and it is painful to look at the fields. But what can one do? People are afraid to go to the fields. People do not harvest crops even next to their own homesteads. He too is not leaving. He has an elderly mother who doesn't want to go. I got used to it. If my mother says that she will not go anywhere, why would her son be afraid to stay? Yes, I was born here and I will die here. I will not go anywhere else. Of 
Of the 2,500 people who lived before the war, only about 500 are left behind. Taiwan is preparing its air raid shelters as rising hostility with China and Russia's invasion of Ukraine raise new fears about the possibility of a Chinese attack on the Democratic Island. It comes amid the U.S. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan this week. She's the most senior U.S. politician in 25 years to visit Taiwan and said her delegation made the trip to make it clear that America would not abandon the island. Drawing condemnation from China, Beijing said the United States will pay the price for the visit. It's an emergency drill for regular everyday people in war. These are civilians in Taiwan, where Russia's invasion of Ukraine and Taiwan's own ongoing and worsening hostilities with China are raising new fears of the possibility of a Chinese attack on the democracy. And so, Taiwanese authorities are also pushing another precaution, prepping their air raid shelters. Not purpose-built bunkers, but safe places in subways, underground shopping malls, underground parking lots and so on. Put in the locations in a smartphone app and posters and launching a social media campaign to get people ready. Almost everyone has a, has a basement in their building. It doesn't matter if they're categorized as an official shelter. What's important is to know what you need to bring with you, what's currently there, uh, and for you, to be, um, for you to be able to stay there for a long period of time. For example, a lot of shelters don't have bathrooms. And we need, we're training our students, we're training our participants to understand that when you go to a bare bones place, how do you improvise? How do you use what you have? And if you have a little bit more preparation, how do you uh, prepare your grab and go bag so that once you're there, you have the medical supplies to help people. You have the tools you need to build a makeshift toilet. You know how to separate where you eat and where you use the bathroom. I think these are very useful skills that we're uh, trying to teach our participants. The capital of Taipei has 4,600 shelters with enough space to accommodate 12 million people. That's over four times its population. China considers Taiwan its territory and has increased military activity in the air and seas around it. Please rise, ladies and gentlemen. The United States House of Representatives Speaker Nancy Pelosi met with Taiwan's President Tsai Ing-wen on Wednesday, pledging ironclad support for the island's democracy. Pelosi arrived in Taipei late on Tuesday on an unannounced but closely watched trip, which has drawn condemnation and vows of retaliation from Beijing. Let's just put it in perspective. Over four decades ago, the Taiwan Relations Act was built in building a strong bond between our two countries, advancing our shared interests of governance, economy, and security, while respecting the One China policy. Our solidarity with you is more important than ever as you defend Taiwan and your freedom. Uh, in our bilateral meeting, we discussed key opportunities to deepen our partnership, upholding democracy and human rights and respect for the individual. Beijing demonstrated its anger with Pelosi's presence on an island that it says is part of China, with a burst of military activity in the surrounding waters, and by summoning the U.S. ambassador in Beijing and announcing the suspension of several agricultural imports from Taiwan. When foreign dispatches returns in just a moment, Fijian villages look to relocate as climate change floods their homes. Please stay with us. Thanks for staying with us on the program. The death toll from the devastating floods that hit Kentucky last week has risen to at least 37 people. Continuous heavy rainfall in late July caused the surge of water levels of many rivers in the state, which destroyed many houses in the area and left thousands without power supply or drinking water. Officials warn the death toll may continue to rise, with more expected rainfall potentially hampering rescue efforts. Days of heavy rainfall, described by authorities as some of the worst in Kentucky's history, caused some homes in the hardest hit areas to be swept away. There's going to be houses that have been separated from their foundations and relocated uh, in streets or just completely washed away in creeks, trailers, vehicles overturned, uh, lots of trees uprooted, roads that have been uh, 
partially are fully destroyed and bridges, small bridges that have been uh, destroyed as well. Businesses have flooded. Those that are still standing, uh, it's, it's pretty bad. Many residents had been unprepared for heavy downfall overnight, leading to more deaths. At least 37 deaths had been confirmed as of Wednesday. This week, authorities continue to work to rescue residents and provide food and shelter for thousands who had been displaced. Uh, we was actually in bed and uh, we, my mom was still awake. She's watching the rain. Uh, within two hours, uh, the floodwaters up on her house. We evacuated with what just we had. We, uh, me and my two children, my nephews, uh, we just had the clothes on our back and uh, that was it. Uh, within two hours, the, the water is up over the roof of our house. And uh, mind you, we live by a little creek. I mean, it's never been that high in history. We've never seen that. I've lived here, you know, 30 years and uh, never seen it like that. So we went on to bed and we woke up the next morning. Our neighbors at the bottom of the hill, the water was up to the top of their back door like it covered their whole trailer. And we were stuck in, we couldn't get off of her hill for like two days. And the lights and water was off. Yeah, lights, no water, no lights, nothing. Just everybody think about the people that are still out there, you know, the ones that's been found every day, the ones that couldn't have been rescued, you know what I'm saying? Think about them and their families. Because to us, the biggest thing for us was that we all got out and we're all here safe, you know. My mom's blind, so that was the biggest thing for us is that we're safe and here together. The floods were the second major disaster to strike Kentucky in seven months, following a swarm of tornadoes that claimed nearly 80 lives in the western part of the state in December. So here in eastern Kentucky, a lot of these people dealt with something very, very similar about a year, year and a half ago in spring of 2021. So now it's repetitive loss for them. You know, they, some people may rebuilt their house after that flooding and now are flooded again. And so that's really devastating and that's really traumatic. Afternoon, there's still 9,000 people without power. There's still about 18,000 people that, that may not have drinkable water. Um, there's so much water on the ground, but that's of course not safe to drink. And so what, what we and our partners are doing at places like this is providing people a safe place to stay, food, water, emotional support. This is obviously so traumatic for them um, and, and just, really comfort and hope, uh, uh, somebody who's there, just letting them know that someone is there and for them and there to help. President Joe Biden declared a major disaster in Kentucky on Friday, July 29, allowing federal funding to be allocated to the state. The village elders of Fiji Serua Islands always believe they would die on the prize land where their chiefs are buried. But as the community runs out of ways to adapt to climate change and the rise in Pacific Ocean, the 80 villagers face the painful decision whether to move or stay. The village elders of Fiji's Serua Island always thought they would be buried here alongside the chiefs. That was before the impact of climate change. Now, at high tide, the rising Pacific Ocean breaches the seawall and floods the village, salt water, inundating gardens. The community is running out of ways to adapt and now faces the same painful decision as many other coastal villages here. Stay or relocate to Fiji's main island to secure a future for the next generation. Resident Senisi says the 80 villagers must move given the flooding erosion and exposure to extreme weather. The sea level before uh, the, the water doesn't come inside the village but now right now we have been experiencing that uh, the sea, sea level is uh, getting very high not like before uh, the water comes in and uh, we are talking about talking about uh, discussing among ourselves to like relocate or get uh, land reclamation done in the island and uh, building a seawall uh, because of the uh, climate change. Eh? This is one community that has successfully relocated from their old village of Vuningdogola in 2014. That move made Fiji the first Pacific Island nation to relocate a community because of rising sea levels. Sailosi Ramatu was village headman at the time of the move in 2014. 
he and the villagers had invited officials to see how they lived with water up to their knees. Ramatu says salt water had destroyed the ability of the 150 residents to grow crops, but that it still took time to persuade the elders to move. We've missed this community so much, you know, because we learned many things about custom tradition, the way of life here, as we are Fijian, uh, uh, how we link to the soil, how we link to the land we live, in our culture, we understand uh, as we were taught from our parents. We were very sad when uh, we moved up to the new village site because we left our grandparents parents behind. We left our big houses behind. Uh, we left the sea. Many Fijians say they once developed nations that contributed the most to global warming to not only curb their emissions, but pay for the steps islanders are having to take. We want to say if the world can work together, the leaders of the world can work together, in any means to combat into the impact of climate change. You know, to make a decision. Uh, if pollution is some of the contribution factors into climate change, how they can lessen polluting the, the, the ocean, polluting the, the sky. Six Fiji villages have moved, or plan to, with government support, and a new process to prioritize the most urgent relocations is still under development. Madanawa is unsure whether it will be feasible for his village to relocate due to funding and the hesitation of many village elders to leave their homes, but he knows change has to happen. Drought has taken a heavy toll on communities in the Horn of Africa, including Kenya's coastal Kalifi County. The ongoing famine has been ravaging Kalifi, where many people rely on farming for a living. Livestock have also been affected by low yield pasture due to the drought conditions. Drought affected communities in Kenya's coastal Kalifi County are suffering from a lack of food and water as extreme weather conditions in the Horn of Africa continue to wreak havoc on people's daily lives. Farmers say they've been hit hard by the drought and the woes are expected to continue. Weather forecasts of drier days ahead have alarmed many in the East African nation. We are struggling so much and our children are even being sent away from school. We have to walk long distances to get casual work on fertile lands where we can earn something. It's risky sometimes because we can be attacked by elephants. The Kenya Meteorological Department has warned that Kilifi County will continue to be marred by below average rainfall. In the month of May this season, uh, we didn't have rains for, for three weeks, most places. The month of May, in the first week we had a, 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 actually a storm. According to a new study by the World Food Programme and the UN's Food and Agriculture Organization, over 50 million people in Eastern Africa will face a serious shortage of food this year. There is still little information on climate change in Africa, and this is affecting how people understand the drought in the Horn of Africa region. I think there's an important question or the messaging around what can we do as far as climate is concerned. And I think this goes back to my earlier point around the opportunity that Africa has. So when we think about the green economy, um, what are ways that Africa can be involved with that? How, you know, what are solutions that young people can begin to develop as far as clim you know, climate change is concerned? According to the FAO, urgent intervention is needed, including cash transfer to support needy families, the provision of animal feed and drought resistant seeds to communities, as well as the restoration of local water sources. In the meantime, the government and aid agencies are trying to reach out to many of the most affected families in an effort to help them tide over the crisis. Well, this is where we say goodbye till next time. But remember, our top stories are never far away. You can catch them on channelcv.com. Thank you so much for watching the program. I'm Tenyo Lashaboale. Bye for now.